Hi everyone and welcome to the first uh, in a new series of hard talks discussing topics around uh, how our industry affects the world in terms of its environmental impact. Uh, this first episode is called Net Zero Sustainability and the Impact of the Cloud. My name is Dean Ramsey, I'm a Principal Analyst at TM Forum and I'm joined today by a great panel of guests, uh, James Crawshaw from Omdia, Monty Hong from Microsoft and Tim O'Farrell from the University of Sheffield here in the UK. So um, let's kick things off, first of all, by having each of our guests briefly introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their current role. Uh, so James, can I start with you, please? Yeah, thanks, Dean. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, James Crawshaw, I'm an analyst with Omdia. It's an industry research firm. I specialize or focus on the uh, telecoms IT, so OSS and uh, BSS systems principally, uh, but I also take in, an interest in, in energy efficiency and how better management of networks can improve the, uh, the energy efficiency. Great, thank you. And Monty? Yeah, hi, I'm Monty Hong uh, with Microsoft. I look after our worldwide uh, telco industry business strategy, so uh, happy to be on the call here, everything. Great, thank you. And finally, Tim. Hello, hi, thanks, uh, Dean. So I'm Tim O'Farrell. I'm, I'm a professor in wireless communications at the University of Sheffield. Um, for many years now, I've been researching the performance of radio access networks. And since 2008, I've been specializing in the energy efficiency of radio access networks. Um, and I'm a, I'm a member of certain major forums, um, such as the UK 5G um, Sustainability and Environment Forum, and I'm recently and soon to join the DCMS College of Experts, where I'll be giving some information and advice on 5G, 6G and energy efficiency. So looking forward to taking part today. Perfect. Thank you very much, Tim. So um, just a quick bit of housekeeping before we start in today's session. Um, it will be about 45 minutes long. There isn't a typical Q&A session at the end but the chat function is open all the way through. So if you have a question for the panel that you think is relevant to the conversation, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat box while we're talking and, and bring in any questions there. Um, so to frame our conversation today, James has agreed to share some of the research that he's done recently. And um, when we think about the environmental impacts of telco operations, um, there are many factors to consider, I suppose, and, and, many ways in which the industry can improve but one of the unavoidable topics is that of energy consumption um, one of my colleagues at tm forum told me recently that if a telco if the telco industry was a country it'd be the third largest producer of greenhouse gases um, in the world behind the us and china so um, you know a great deal of that is down to the amount of electrical energy that we use running our networks so obviously this is something that's increasingly under the spotlight given the worldwide drive to become uh, net zero or carbon neutral and there's government and regulatory pressures have forced that to happen. So James, can I hand it over to you for five minutes and you can frame the conversation and we can, we can talk about what's, what's the scale of the challenge that the industry is facing? Sure, Dean, yeah, happy to. <clears throat> Thanks again. Um, Ali, I think we've got some slides to share. There we go. Okay, so um, this is, as Dean mentioned, this is from some research that, uh, that we at Omdia published last year, looking into this topic of uh, energy efficiency in the telecom industry. Um, and what you can see in front of you now is a, is a table from uh, an ITU report, uh, which was uh, an estimate for in the year 2015, how much energy, how many terawatt hours of energy was consumed by different areas within the field of information communications technology. Um, and uh, you have the percentages on the right, uh, the, the top four rows are the, the, the mobile and network operators, which collectively are around 20%, so around a fifth of all of the, the energy that is consumed by the ICT industry, or at least as it was back in, in 2015, according to these estimates. So the, the bigger um, energy consumers within ICT are in, are in fact things like data centers, uh, and then of course the, the end user devices, the smartphones that we all carry in our pockets and are constantly recharging our television sets, uh, etc. So telecoms, uh, as Dee mentioned, you know, it is a big consumer of electricity, but it is by no means the, uh, 
the big greedy hog within the ICT sector. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Uh, so then uh, focusing specifically on telecoms, where, where are they using this, this energy, this, this electricity principally? And a few operators do give this uh, information in their annual reports. Um, different ways of disclosing, but you can see, you know, on a broad brush basis, KDDI in Japan say, well, it's sort of 60% mobile, 40% everything else. Um, Telefonica gives a more granular breakdown. For them, about 50% is mobile base stations. Uh, about a third is fixed access. So think of all of that copper network that they still have in many parts of the world. Um, and then uh, some smaller categories. So for them, for example, data centers is a relatively small part of the total. Uh, and then Vodafone on the right, uh, slightly different breakdown there and a slightly different business mix to Telefonica, hence a greater proportion of, of the energy there is, is going to be principally mobile. Uh, and then they have um, the mobile exchanges uh, and data centers, etc. So if you go to the next slide, the point of that slide being that mobile is a big consumer within the telecom industry. So why uh, are we concerned? Why are we having this conversation today? Why have many people been uh, talking about energy you know, getting out of control in the telecom industry? Well, partly it's to do with 5G. Uh, and people are concerned that 5G is going to be more power hungry uh, and that that's going to lead to some significant increase in energy consumption by telecom operators. Well, there's a number of factors. Uh, obviously, these 5G networks, uh, as Tim, I think, will be able to explain much better than I, uh, they are more efficient on a per bit basis, so less joules per bit of energy uh, of information transferred. But of course, given more bandwidth, given more capacity, people tend to use it. Uh, so there'll be more bits carried uh, and as a result, probably more energy consumed uh, with 5G. Uh, so it's not a particular problem of 5G technology. It's the fact that we're just going to use it a lot more than we did with 4G and previous Gs. Uh, people also talk about densification of the network, lots of small cells. There are some concerns that that could lead to uh, extra uh, power consumption. However, there are studies that suggest just the opposite, that by having those small cells, you'll be able to turn down the, the transmitter power on the, uh, the macro cells and, and, and overall your solution will consume less. So it's up in the air exactly what, which is correct of those two uh, models. Massive MIMO, that's frequently cited as a very power hungry uh, element within 5G. There's going to be additional antennas, all of them with their own power amplifiers. Uh, and yes, that does lead to a big increase in, in power consumption. And within your, if it's, if you have uh, some electronics at the cell site or perhaps in a, uh, you know, a more central, like an, an edge computing location, those locations may need uh, air conditioning. Uh, and if you've got more data being processed uh, and bigger um, servers processing all of that information, then that could require additional cooling. And cooling, as I think we'll see, is a big, um, uh, a big consumer of, of electricity within this uh, area. On the next slide, Ali, please. So um, <clears throat> this is just a sort of broad brush uh, areas within which operators can look to improve their, their mobile network efficiency. Um, so obviously they, they source their, their network um, devices from manufacturers who are going to use the latest components made with the latest geometries, uh, and uh, they are going to be more energy efficient than the legacy components, legacy semiconductors, uh, that, uh, that have um, different geometries. Uh, sleep mode is a very popular way of uh, improving energy efficiency. You can put the whole cell to, to sleep, perhaps at night when it's not being used, put certain carriers to sleep, uh, again, during periods of low usage, uh, or, or even put um, certain antennas to sleep, if it's, for example, one of these MIMO antennas. The auxiliary resistance, that refers essentially to the air conditioning, uh, and there are alternative approaches you can take. So instead of putting all of your electronics uh, inside a, a shed uh, and keeping it cooled with uh, air conditioning system, you could actually have those uh, electronics mounted on the pole and cooled naturally by uh, passing air currents. Uh, network management, there's lots of scope there. Uh, think of things like self-organizing networks and the energy efficiency um, use cases uh, that are available to operators 
to, uh, to reduce energy consumption. And finally, energy efficiency should be considered right at the beginning in the network planning uh, and design phase. It's not an afterthought that, that you, you do once the network's built. It should be something that's taken into account right from the get-go. If we go to the next slide, Ali. So I think this is the last one I've got, and this is just a sort of cartoon. These aren't actual numbers in uh, megawatt hours or anything, um, but these are sort of broad brush uh, estimates <clears throat> based on feedback we've had from, from operators and vendors. We start off with an initial scenario. Most of your mobile network um, energy consumption is probably related to 4G, uh, certainly in, um, uh, in developed markets. And then as you introduce 5G, well, for most operators, this is you know, extra uh, power consumption, new, new radios and new um, uh, channels, new bands, uh, and that adds to your overall energy consumption. Now to try and combat that, well, the first thing you might look at doing is retiring 3G. A lot of operators uh, around the world uh, are, uh, are trying to, to do that. They're having to keep their 2G network for various reasons, IoT, um, interoperability, et cetera. But um, 3G is generally something that uh, operators uh, are trying to, to switch off and that can help to reduce energy consumption. And then as you move um, traffic from 4G, more of it onto the more efficient 5G, that will also help to uh, reduce your energy consumption. There's this concept of single RAN. Not all operators have that today, but the idea being that instead of having equipment from um, different equipment for all of the different generations of mobile technology, you would replace that with one single RAN that handles, let's say, 2G, 4G, and 5G in one set of equipment, and that itself is more energy efficient. The small cells argument, as I mentioned earlier, some people say that could increase energy consumption. Other people say if you plan your network correctly, it could actually help to reduce it. <clears throat> and then finally, optimization, optimization of the network that you've got using SON uh, or in the, uh, the new paradigm of, of Open RAN using some of the, um, the X apps and R apps uh, that are available as part of the RAN intelligent control. Ultimately, the objective there would be to try and get back to where you started in terms of energy consumption or even potentially reduce it. Um, are we going to get there? I think that remains to be seen. We can talk about it a little bit more in the discussions. My personal belief, what I've sort of figured out over the last year or so, is that <clears throat> operators do have the tools available to them to uh, curtail, to reduce their energy consumption in their mobile networks but they choose not to use them because they could interfere with the performance. Um, and essentially they want to make sure that they, they score very highly in consumer reviews of the performance and availability and throughput of their networks. Um, and so it really comes down to the, the consumer. Are you prepared to go uh, and switch to an operator who's going to be uh, greener, consume less energy, if that means that perhaps your, your, your bandwidth, your speeds will be lower? remains to be seen. Okay, so that's all I had, Dean, by way of introduction. Right, thanks, James. It's, um, you know, fr from just that brief intro, I think we can see this is a, a really complex situation. And um, so I, I'd like to go to Tim first, if I could, and, and, and um, some of the topics that James was covering there were, we're seeing 5G deployments increasing and, and 5G seems to be more power hungry but um, uh, no, sorry, less power hungry, but there is more of it. Um, so, you know, this, this trend that we're seeing towards power consumption going up, um, it, it seems that when you look at the energy consumption of some operators, it seems to be quite flat and others, it seems to be rising, even though they're all rolling out 5G. Do you, what way do you see this going, Tim, over the next kind of decade? Is, it, is, is the overall, um, in this in this balance, is the overall net result going to be more more energy consumption? Uh, thanks, Dean. I, I think the the short answer to that is there's a concern that the energy consumption is going to be higher, and it fundamentally is going to stem from deploying more infrastructure, which amounts to deploying more radios. And as we saw from James's figures and is quite well understood in the sector, it's the radio and the base stations which are the really power hungry D 
devices and units within the uh, radio access network. So where we're going to see more of those deployed, um, we should expect to see energy efficient uh, energy consumption increasing. And something has to be done about that. So the, the question is, what are they going to do in order to limit that growth in energy consumption, which is likely to come along with the growth in density of infrastructure? And I think, you know, the, the thing which causes a lot of confusion on this is on one side of the fence, we have this energy efficient metric, which is the bit per joule metric, which shows that on a per transmission basis, 5G is a lot more efficient than 4G. So we're sending more bits for the same amount of energy, but it doesn't address this operational aspect, which is what is the concern here is when something becomes more efficient, there is a paradox and James kind of referred to this, we tend to end up installing more of it and using more of it. And it's that which is potentially going to grow the um, energy consumption. Now, um, you mentioned about the different operators and their energy consumption figures, their electricity bills. Um, I'm not an exact expert on that. I, I have looked at the Vodafone reports and seen that figure over the last three years. And you're quite right, it hasn't grown much at all. It's, it's quite a stable figure, but their CO2 um, emissions have gone down over the same period. So I'm a little confused as to why the electricity bill is, so to speak, our consumption is still the same, but they are managing to reduce their CO2 um, emissions. So that's part of the confusion, I think, which comes along with this as well. So trying to understand where these figures come from is part of what we need to do better, part of what we need to know. Yeah, I, I think on the Vodafone case, I heard um, at their Investors Day presentations that during the Q&A, there was a question about their energy consumption being flat and them, them being a kind of outlier in the industry where, where everyone else's is going up. And they said that they were, you know, there are 20 different things they're doing, uh, including smart grid, uh, you know, IoT smart management of the power on the base stations, and they were looking into um, looking into renewable energy sources at the base stations. You know, solar and wind and all of those sort of things. Um, but they, they got a whole raft of of answers for for that question. Um, but it it does seem to be unique. In, well, not unique, but it seems to be an outlier in the industry. I think it's. Uh, generally uh, from the figures we've seen the energy consumption is going up um monty you 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 work with some of the biggest telcos in the world so what what are you seeing from microsoft's point of view that that the introduction of 5g is uh what impact is that having with with your customers and what what are they doing about uh, mitigating some of that energy rise yeah, I think, you know, uh, thanks, Dean, for having me on. I think you listen to James and what Tim are saying is there's a lot of stuff around just the overall energy consumption. So I do think that we're seeing, you know, a lot of trends, whether it be, as, as James pointed out, you know, data centers are a huge cost, a lot of data center consolidation, a lot of, you know, uh, you know, large, you know, processing of data now being able to be done, you know, leveraging cloud economics is, is, is saving on, on some of that. I think also just, you um, the ability to kind of continue to to refresh you know all the compute and storage components uh lend itself well to you know the overall you know movement to cloud i, I also think that as we start to see more of a, of a shift from it workloads to the network workloads allow then the the operators to take the ability to take some of their uh, network operations in, in a hybrid cloud type of a, of a structure which i think it's also you know better you know, better overall sustainability, better um, uh, economics from that perspective. So I think it's the challenge we're seeing, I think, is, is that this overall sustainability is not just one piece. There's a broad value chain, I think, is, you know, if you look at the stuff that James and Tim have outlined in some of their material and their discussions, is you got to understand all the moving parts of it, right? So, you know, as 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 Microsoft, you know, we look at all of our suppliers and and leveraging, you know, how how their sustainability is going. Because as we uh, consume more of a company who has got a sustainability um, focus, then we're actually then um, acquiring, you know, greener technology. At the same time, we use that to provide. And so I think that operators, as you know, your your example with Vodafone and others, 
as they improve their overall tele, you know, connectivity services and, and other business application services to this ecosystem, that adds up in the overall ecosystem. Because I think at the end of the day, we're trying to solve this broader you know, ecosystem sustainability. You know, if one, you know, it's ultimately the goal would be is, you know, as you're consuming that, you know, that, that energy that you're also at that location, also doing it in a way that you're reducing it. Not that you're just using credits from one part of the world and, and offsetting with where you're at in the other. I mean, ultimately to move to your ecosystems and where you're selling to and buying from are all, you know, part of that overall sustainability value chain. So that's some of the stuff that we're seeing. I think cloud plays a part in that, but, but so do many other factors within this, right? I think, you know, the war on waste, you know, the, the way we look, I think James talked about and one of his number, big numbers is, is just all the devices that are being used. So, you know, you, you know what, what role are the operators playing as we refresh handsets and tablets and everything else, making sure those are done in, in, a, more, in, a, more, in a more green way. So it's really looking at those big pieces from the mobile network, the data centers, the devices, uh, you know, and then and I think what, what cloud also brings is this cloud economics, they can use that data to more appropriately plan where you roll out your base station. You can, you can leverage that data to, from a network planning, network operations, which is some of James's data, you know, you know, talked about those are ways of, of addressing this. So I think those are some of the broader trends that we're seeing is really this, this movement to solving the ecosystem sustainability and then leveraging uh, all the power of each of the players within that. Yeah, you, you, you make a good point there. I think that when we talk about the telecoms industry in inverted commas, we, we, we're often just talking about CSPs. And, and so, you know, if you start delving down into the, the green credentials of the CSPs, you don't have the whole picture. And certainly over the last few years with the supply chain changing and the move to cloud and the involvement of hyperscalers and other technology providers, the, the ecosystem has changed dramatically, right? So I guess, are, are you seeing, Monty, are you seeing the, the telcos that you work with taking that into consideration? Are they thinking with their sustainability goals? Are they thinking, yeah. oh, these are the suppliers I mean, I'm working with? Yeah, and these are, these are C-suite discussions. You know, our CEOs talk to many of the uh, you know, operators, and we, we've got a, a whole large team around our sustainability efforts is Microsoft, right? But yeah, we've probably got, you know, eight to 10 telcos at any given time that are heavily deep in, in sustainability. And we've got more than actually uh, coming on board, you know, every week. Because I, I do think it's, it's moved beyond, there's a question in the chat, it's moved just beyond this, should we do it for the broader societal good to where there's real, there's real economics that can be seen, right? launching new sustainability green products that, you know, that we see through areas like Deutsche Telekom and some of the others, um, but also of, of, you know, operators really looking to do data center consolidation and, and, and making those more sustainable from both the, you know, consumption of the energy to the real estate that they're using to all the other players that they're, they're buying with. So I would say that this is really, you know, pivoted more to being just a, doing something for societal good, but also meeting a lot of operators economic objectives and serving customers better. And, and I think addressing the various demands they have from their, their customers. And so I would say that, you know, there's there's a large number, if not most of the telcos around the world are, are, are aggressively pursuing this broader sustainability. Um, but I don't think it's just a, you know, telco industry thing, because it also, there's a lot of horizontal, you know, areas that can be can be applied from other from other industries on the war on waste and, and efficient use of real estate and, and as you said, there's a lot of stuff that other industries have used around sensors and, and, and video analytics and other things that really improves the overall efficiency of operations, improves the overall uh, dynamics that are going through. And how do you harvest those technologies in a sustainable way to reduce then you know, having to have people go out and do uh, you know, site inspections at a site? So can you use video analytics to look at you know, motion detection stuff around a cell site and secure it? versus having to have you know, people drive out in the car and secure it and so on and so forth. So it's little things, but to add those all up in the value chain is what we're seeing amongst many of the telcos right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So James, Tim, what do you think about that? Do you think this, this um, I know that lots of the operators have got, um, they've, they've uh, appointed uh, chief sustainability officers recently. We're seeing that quite a lot. And you know they, they've committed to, plans to become carbon neutral by the 2040s we're seeing that quite a lot is, is that 
uh, realistic, do you think, is, is it as, as part of this new ecosystem, is it something that they could actually do or is it kind of just paying lip service to, uh, to the, the current trend for greening up damaging industries? What's your opinion? Um, okay, Dean, I'll, I'll, I'll go first on that because okay. I've got a little bit of experience on it from um, going back to 2008 when I first got into this area. Uh, I was leading a project called Green Radio, which was essentially the first large scale international research project on the greening of mobile. And that project had a large number of vendors and um, service providers, mobile network operators involved in it. And at the time, um, they were very concerned about the issue and they did so, so to speak, begin that process of making commitments to reducing their CO2 emissions, energy consumption. And it was very much in vogue in the period between 2008, 2012. But then after that, with 4G being launched and established, their foot went came off of the uh, gas pedal, so to speak. And they, they made promises then. There were, there were promises which they made as not official or commitments fully, but intentions. But they did back off of those intentions. Um, and now what we're seeing is because the issue has become so much more pressing, has so much more publicity associated with it, we see again the, these commitments being made. Now, I, I would tend to say that in the second round of this commitment, that yes, I think the, um, the mobile network operators, the vendors, are taking this now much more seriously and uh, making real efforts to address the issue. It's not to say that they didn't do anything before. There were changes in their practices. They had introduced into their procurement, um, for example, Vodafone, I know this, to make sure they were buying equipment which on the procurement specification had lower energy ratings. So that became a competitive point. And now what we're seeing also with that is through the 5G standardization process, that there's been features and facilities introduced to try to bring about energy efficiency. We see this energy efficient metric which came out of those early studies in a European project. So, so things are being adopted and I, I would say these companies, the operators and the vendors are now addressing this issue with a lot more gusto. So I do see them going forward as taking this seriously and beginning to bring um, solutions to bear. Whether they'll get there or not is a bit of another problem because I think as referred to James, Monty, yourself, it's a very complex problem. And that's where a lot of the discussion is going to focus on. How do we deal with this very complex problem? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, just on, on that topic we, in, the, in the chat function, uh, we had uh, Will Kirkpatrick from Virgin Media O2 who said that uh, they are increasingly being asked by business customers to provide accurate energy and emission estimates for the services that, that Virgin O2 provide to them. So breaking, breaking it down to a customer level. So, you know, some some industry pressure there too as a, as a partner mm. um his question is do the panel have any advice on how to approach this um is that something that you've you've had experience with uh tim in the past that that the operators are, are being asked by their business customers to provide their credentials yeah i i i think it's rising in terms of the frequency of that um what we're seeing is most of this information seems to be coming through their annual reports. Yeah. And that information comes through in various degrees of clarity and accuracy, I would say. Some of them produce very good annual reports, which help us to understand what is happening. But there's quite a few others where it's very, very difficult to really understand what, what really is taking place and what changes are being made. So um, I, I think really the, the advice there, I would say, is there needs to be more pressure to get the companies to reveal in more detail with greater clarity and consistently across them. So there needs to perhaps be a little bit more regulation to get a consistent ex exposition of what they are doing and what their actual 
figures, uh, how they're evolving and how they can be compared. So we see movement, we see useful information, but it's that a lot more needs to come through, I believe. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would agree to sort of Will's point. I think uh, Jishri had a, a question as well, you know, similar to that. I do think a lot of the companies are producing, you know, and in parts around reports or even additional parts, you know, their reports. I know at Microsoft, we've been doing that now for a couple of years. And, but I will tell you that, it, it, you know, having been sat through a number of sessions with, with our Microsoft team and, and operators, you know, it's like, it's like going back to class and mathematics because it's, it's a, the, the carbon neutral pricing is a lot of, a lot of math and a lot of understanding the components, you know, and I think, you know, it gets back to, you know, there's, there's these different ways of, you know, using carbon offsets to ultimately get into a point of, of where you're consuming stuff at, at a rate that, that is less than, you know, than, you know, or you're balancing that that's supply and demand side of things. And so I think the, the, the overall, carbon neutral pricing is extremely complex and understanding you know, there's some lower hanging fruit and others, but to Tim's point, what James went through, it's a myriad of these. And I do think that you see on, you know, on most of all the hyperscalers, a lot of the operators are doing as well as other companies producing more and more of, you know, annual reports and publicly available information. But I think you have to go out there and look for that and then understand how do you play within that? Because, you know, another question that was in there is, is if you shift kind of compute, say, from, from your own premise on a data center to the cloud doesn't necessarily resolve it all. It's got to be done in a way that, that, that has that, that carbon pricing factored into, into it. So I, think, I do think there's a lot around the math and the algorithms used on, on the carbon pricing that, that I think we all would benefit by sharing more and more information on. Yeah, and, and maybe some uh, standardization of the metrics used. It seems that most of the reports I've read have, have got a you know a wide mixture of metrics used to measure to measure carbon neutrality or 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 their their efficiency and uh, and 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 you know it, when you're reading them it seems like it's it's almost a way to mask the actual real data and and so i think if there was a more standardized approach to it it may it may be helpful james i, I in your presentation i was thinking about when you talked about how um Lots of the operators have the tools and facilities to be able to to uh, influence their energy consumption, but but opt not to. Do you think that that's that is will will be the case maybe in ten years time that that the two things can't coexist like maximum efficiency of the network and and um, the, the power saving? You know, the, are we are is is the performance always going to be? Uh, at odds with with being power efficient. Uh, well, yes, in a, in, a, in, a, in a word, yes. So uh, it, it's about you know the the consumer and what the consumer values, and uh, so really it sort of builds on what um, Will Kirkpatrick was was asking. So if if enterprises and consumers care about energy consumption and and you know effectively their own contribution to uh, the COC footprint, um, they would be prepared perhaps to not watch streaming video whilst they're on their phone waiting at a bus stop um, and wait until they got home or, or, or read a book instead. Um, so there are there are choices that we as consumers, whether we're individuals or enterprises, can can make. Um, and uh, but I don't think that's a it's a, it's an easy um, nut to crack. Um, I mean, again, building on what Will was asking, there, I think one of the French mobile operators recently said they were going to start putting on their bills an estimate of the CO2 footprint of the, the service that the consumer had had used. And obviously, they're not calculating how many joules they're using and converting that into molecules of CO2, they're just making a broad brush estimate, you know, based on maybe the number of um, megabytes of data they've, they've consumed. And I think really a similar approach will would have to be done with enterprise customers. You'd have to make some sort of broad brush estimates based on voice minutes and you know, gigabytes or whatever of, of data that, that's being um, um, carried over their networks. I did want to come back to some earlier points, um, Dean, that, that um, we, we, we touched on earlier. So we, we talked about Vodafone, how is it that they're able to keep their energy relatively flat uh, and, and get the CO2 down? 
Well, actually, I mean, I've not got a full history, but I looked at a number of, of operators uh, over the last couple of years. Some were up, some were down. I think on average, from a sample of 10, uh, the, they were up about 2 or 3%. So I, I wasn't seeing huge uh, increases there. And it was mainly the Chinese operators who were increasing their electricity consumption, not the, the um, Europeans or, or North Americans. H how does Vodafone get their CO2 down whilst con consuming the same amount of uh, of electricity? Well, they do it by um, purchasing electricity from green sources. So they have power purchasing agreements with a particular solar farm or wind farm, uh, and uh, they agree to effectively fund that project, buy the electricity from it, um, and that's then enables them to re you know, lower their, their CO2 footprint. Um, and then we talked a little bit about the economic arguments. Well, electricity is um, electricity costs are one, two percent of revenue for operators. So, you know, the more you can reduce your energy consumption, the more you could potentially boost your, your profitability. But, you know, as we were talking about earlier, the trade off is that it would impact the performance of your mobile network, for example, if you started putting all of your cell sites to sleep in the middle of the day to save energy. Um, and I think we talked earlier, so there was a question about power consumption shifts to the hyperscalers. Um, I, I don't think the hyperscalers are consuming electricity instead of telecom operators. I think hyperscalers in their data centers are displacing enterprise data centers. Um, and the jury's still out here. There are, there are different estimates. There's estimates from US academics and European consultants that slightly differ. Uh, the US academics suggest that actually the, the greater efficiency of those hyperscalers has meant that uh, data center energy consumption globally has remained roughly flat over the last 10 years. Sounds incredible, but you know, you think about the efficiency of those hyperscalers versus lots of small data centers. Uh, the European estimates, I think, suggest a roughly a sort of 10% growth. I uh, can't remember if that's per annum. But um, but they're estimates. We, we don't seem to have concrete data uh, on that. And then finally, I think there was some discussion there about devices. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I think Deutsche Telekom is one of the operators who's been promoting a more sustainable handset. I uh, can't remember exactly how it's more sustainable, but uh, it was announced earlier last year. And, and obviously, the, the less often that you... Uh, replace your handset uh, and, and the more often that you repair it uh, and change the battery if your device manufacturer allows you to do that um, the, 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 that's going to have a far bigger impact on, on sustainability of uh, our consumption of telecom services than, than putting a couple of base stations to sleep. Yeah I, I, I wasn't prepared to talk about devices today I hadn't even crossed my mind so I'm glad you mentioned it but um, it's I suppose it's one of those those huge uh, disposable items that, that hundreds of millions are produced every year and, and out they go into the world. And, um, you know, you see Apple advertising that they have uh, specialist machines that can dismantle the phones and not only Apple phones to be able to recycle them. But we've only just started seeing that in the last few years. So that means there are probably just billions of handsets out there in the world that are unrecyclable or, or unrecycled. Um, and that production continues. Um, but let's let's talk about the cloud. Let's you mentioned hyperscalers there, and and I guess um, this is kind of the most profound change in our industry at the moment: the shift to the cloud. And and um, it's often toted that it, it is a, a more environmentally responsible way of doing things. You know that there are there are many many benefits to moving to the cloud from an operational point of view, but you know from a sustainability point of view, it's also good. Um, is is that something that uh, you think is, is true for a start? That, that's my question. Uh, um, Monty, what, what about you? That, I guess, I guess your, your answer is yes, but... Um, <laughs> but well, well, I mean, it's yes, but I also think it's just part of an overall very complex equation with a lot of, you know, partners in it. I mean, it's, it's, it's clearly you get, you, know, you get the cloud economics, which gets you, I think, by definition, a lot of, you know, improvements in sustainability, but it also means that it's hyperscalers you know, we've got to make sure we've got the right power consumption, right use of real estate that we're buying from people that also, you know, have that in. And, and that's why I think each of, 
you know, the broader cloud world understands, you know, what, what are the cloud economics relative to, you know, carbon neutral pricing and everything. So I don't think it's as simple to say is that hyperscalers by definition are going to be, uh, you know, better or worse than, than any other enterprise. I think it's, a, it's still, as, as, as Tim and James said, it's a broader focus on what you want to do. I know at Microsoft, there's a huge focus by our leadership team, uh, you know, for that. But I think there is at all the hyperscalers. I do think that, you know, if you look at just, you know, allowing, especially in this pandemic, we're allowed more of, you know, the the hybrid workforce and what and what operators provide, operators and and hyperscalers provide to other enterprise companies, allowing, uh, you know, workers to work in a hybrid mode, which ultimately will solve and help address, you know, the sustainability and, and greener objectives. A lot of those enterprise and workers, people not traveling as much, people making, you know, greater use of digital technologies. Uh, so I do think that there are clear benefits of, of moving, you know, into, into certain workloads into the cloud, because I think you'll also hyperscalers, the investments we're making in technology and, and with a huge focus on greener technology means you know, always, you know, increased access to the newest technology, which will by definition include more and more, you know, sustainability of, um, components of that. So I think it's really more just um, things like that, but I do think it's hyperscalers, with the others are just part of the overall thing. So I think it's both how we consume and how we procure that's 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 also critical on, on all parts of those equations. Yeah. I, I suppose there's an optimization angle to that too, that as as telcos move to the cloud, they have less overhead in their networks and in their in yeah. IT systems. And and so yeah. that's something that we've always had to build in. And and it's wastage basically. So in, in a in a kind of virtualized IT cloud scenario, you're you're removing. Yeah, that. And, and and as James and Tim have pointed out, there's a lot of cost, you know, a lot of inefficiencies and a lot of uh, you know challenges with green effects in networks. But as networks, as portions then can take advantage of you know cloud cloud technology and virtualize more of the network. And I think you're going to see those 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 savings come through. Just like you know, I think hyperscalers look to operators to as we as we purchase, you know, operator infrastructure to look to see how how green each operator is, because it factors into all of our stuff. So I do think that you know the the bigger movement from you know mobile networks, especially to cloud technologies, will allow for you know greener aspects of the overall you know network side, where both James and Tim have pointed out you know great opportunities. But it only is, is part of that, right? So I do think that. The overall movement to cloud will, will have multiple benefits if, if done, as I think James and Tim said, understand what are the right standards, what are the objectives we're trying to hit, what are some of those guidelines that we can do. I don't think it's just the actual move to cloud that gets you that without some mm -hmm. sort of prescriptive, uh, you know, way of looking at it and, and quantifying it. Yeah, and, and and Tim, do you think that line of thinking relates to the RAN too? Because I guess if if we're talking about uh, changing the way that the RAN is is built and and disaggregating uh, the RAN in in 5G for for uh, you know edge cloud and doing all of those kind of new things at the edge uh, is that is is that more power hungry and more uh, you know I th I, th I think that 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 line of thinking maybe breaks down at the at the in the radio network does it not Yeah, elements of it do, Dean. Yes, I mean overall. My, my personal opinion is I would be optimistic of the um, the cloud's contribution to this. Um, I think the principle there, which uh, Monty alluded to, is um, there's far more degrees of freedom within the cloud. So it's going to create more opportunities and broader scopes to do things. So, for example, um, the intelligent controllers, which, which are going to be introduced for RANs, is likely to function more effectively from a cloud base, for example. Um, you've got all that data there already. So introducing the AI, the machine learning type functionality, which are going to be controlling the network and controlling these features such as the sleep modes, turning things off when they're not needed, when they're not being used. I, I kind of see things like that being catered for better through the cloud over the long term. Now, I think part of the issue, though, is, is more the near term or how we evolve and get to the cloud. Um, it's interesting to see those. I think there's a couple of companies in there. There's a company in the States called Dish, 
and there's a, there's a Japanese company which are kind of new, new to the mobile network operator field, and they're introducing the cloud solution, putting the RAN in the cloud, as opposed to the established mobile network operators. Now, the established operators have the problem that they've got legacy systems and infrastructure already there, and they're not going to change immediately into the cloud. It's going to be an evolution and an introduction for them. And the other problem is, I think, that has to be taken into account is these mobile network operators know how difficult it is to actually effectively manage a base station, 100 parameters to control, and those parameters need to be controlled in close proximity to where the base station is. So there's a bit of a learning curve, which is going to mean this introduction of cloud is again going to be later rather than sooner, immediate. The new entries perhaps as a way of getting in, the established entries I suspect less so. Now, you mentioned then the disaggregation, the open run effect. Yeah, I think that all contributes to this as being something which um, with the disaggregation, you've got a bit of a problem with the power consumption. It's, you, you no longer got everything under one roof and making it system-wise energy efficient. And the cloud emphasis on that is a point of analysis that needs to be investigated, basically. We don't know if it will be better or worse at this point in time. So it's a case that that really needs to be looked at a bit more closely. So I think there's a number of things technologically developing at the moment, which would provide inertia to the adoption of the cloud on an immediate large scale. And I think there's another of several political issues and ownership issues. You know, you've got the IT sector coming in and gobbling up mobile network operators. Um, where is the data stored? Um, who owns that data? Um, there's, there's all sorts of socio-economic and socio-techno problems associated with that, which are going to add to those questions. So there's a trend, I see it overall positive, but still got a lot of questions actually to, to be resolved before we're, we're fully engaged with the cloud. All right, James, do you want to pick up on any of that? Sorry, I've lost track of what the question was. <laughs> uh, uh, talking about the cloud and, and its efficiencies and, and uh, as, as, a, as a kind of, you know, the, the, the profound trend towards the cloud. And, and I was just asking uh, Tim about, you know, the, the, new, the new ways of, of operating around that this is spurned. It seems that there, there may be some problems with, uh, you know, the open RAN model or, or disaggregating RAN. So you've got small cell arrangements or things like that. It seems to have, um, it seems to be contradictory to, to the, the, the bigger idea of the cloud being more efficient and more, and therefore, you know, helping you to, to run a more efficient and, and energy saving network. Uh, well, specifically on Open RAN, I do know that one of the big Scandinavian equipment vendors has done some um, scenario analysis, and they they've looked at the trade-off between uh, using um, uh, edge data centers to host these uh, distributed and centralized units, um, and uh, versus versus running those in, on dedicated. Um, devices in, in traditional base stations. So dedicated devices, dedicated ASICs, inherently more energy efficient than general purpose processors. However, uh, the fact that you are consolidating your processing in, in one site and using virtualization means you can switch off servers when they're not being used, unlike traditional base stations where you might have a very efficient ASIC, but it's running 24 seven. And, and this Scandinavian vendor you know, according to the you know the the model that they ran the the experiment, they thought that all in all it was it was slightly more energy efficient was the open run approach. But you know that was a model. You know that remains to be seen. I think probably it's not going to make a huge difference. It's probably a a bit of a wash. Yeah, I, I think that um, when I was thinking about this this issue last week, I was thinking about how there have been network optimization and planning vendors out there for decades, uh, you know, and and.
every large operator you can think of will have a series of interactions with these vendors and products and software services from them. And, you know, are, are we, were we maybe already optimized to the max with in LTE? And, and so when, when we're moving to 5G, all, all of the, the things that the optimization strategy that should have been built, built into 5G as the standard was being um, brought together, are, are those things actually happening? You know, it, it seems that um, when we talk about its, its power consumption being less per bit, it's um, it. It seems like we're already optimized to the max, and and so I, I, I. It always feels like the argument that like oh we can further optimize the network to to help out on an environmental stance. It doesn't seem doesn't seem credible to me. Well, if I can, and also just to answer one of the questions from from the audience, you know what what can be done apart from just putting cell sites to sleep. Um, so these are some examples of what various operators have talked about as, as ways that they have reduced their energy consumption. So if I, if I, if I can name drop, at and talked about NFE specifically, enabling them to reduce energy consumption. China Telecom just talks about ongoing um, elimination of old inefficient equipment. Uh, Deutsche Telekom talks about, for example, migrating to all IP, um, getting rid of, again, legacy equipment. NTT uh, talks about consolidating their equipment, replacing uh, equipment with more energy efficient versions. Telefonica talks a lot about replacing copper with fiber optic in, in, in the access network. Um, Verizon, they talk about um, reducing carbon intensity by moving again to, to newer, more energy efficient uh, technologies. And there are similar anecdotes in the area of cooling, uh, in the area of um, uh, replacing uh, air conditioning systems or network sharing is, is a huge opportunity where, where operators could be uh, more energy efficient by not just sharing towers, but by sharing electronic equipment. And that's one of the things that, that Open RAM will potentially uh, allow in, in a more flexible way. So th there's lots, lots of uh, levers to pull out there by no means uh, have we reached uh, peak 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 um, optimization. Great, good, good answer. Very good. <laughs> if, if I could add to that, uh, again, it's the you, you quoted the bit per dual metric as your driver, and what's been optimized is the throughput, more bits, but not the energy being reduced. So our numerator's gone up dramatically in five G, but the denominator, the energy. Um, has also gone up, but not as much. So it looks good, but with burning as much energy, if not more, that's, that's where the optimization. So this list which James went through is about reducing the energy. And, that, and that's where the optimization needs to be. Um, this has not been addressed um, dramatically enough, we, I would say at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and just to pick up on that comment from the the, the um, one of the listeners on sleep modes, is there more that we can do than sleep modes? Um, there is in terms of the design of the network architecture, but we, we suffer a massive problem there as um, designing the architectures re requires a kind of a clean slate. That makes it difficult. And do we have accurate up-to-date models? Do we have digital twins? And are we able to cope with the system of system solutions we need? That's really stopping us. Um, and so it comes back to sleep modes. Sleep modes are important because we use the word sleep mode singularly, but there's all sorts of kind of sleep modes, uh, micro sleep modes, deep sleep modes. Are you turning everything off? Are you partially turning things off? And the bottom line is you do want to turn things off where you can, because that will stop energy from being consumed. But it's how you go about it and how that, how that is actually implemented per se in the network and through the standard. So there's an awful lot more that we can do to reduce that energy and, and improve and optimize and, and, and really focus on that rather than putting all the energy into increasing the throughput. <laughs> right, I'm happy to have my cynicism challenged. Um, one last question, I'm aware of time. Um, I, the, the, the metrics that we're looking at for power consumption and our environmental impact at the moment all seem to be quite 
you know, um, they seem to be going the wrong way. Is, is this just a, a result of the phase that we're in at the moment, uh, the, the development of, of 5G and 4G still being where it is and not being turned down yet? We're not, haven't really started refarming tons of the, the 3G uh, network that's out there. And it, so do you think that uh, over the next four or five years, as that starts to happen and the shift happens that, that, the ability of 5G to be more, um, to be greener, it, it will, do you think that impact will start to take hold? James, can I come to you first? <laughs> um, so... Uh, the question is basically, how, how long is it going to take to get rid of LTEs? Is, 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 is. <laughs> but, but my cartoon suggested that, yes, it, it's possible. Um, and, you know, as I talked about, operators have got these levers, but there might be a performance hit. And are you prepared to take that? If, you, if you're not prepared to take that, if you think it's absolutely fundamental that people can stream cat videos whilst they're walking the dog, then fine. But if, if you really care about uh, you know, energy efficiency or, or reducing your CO2 footprint, um, don't just uh, buy green energy, you know, actually make your network run more energy efficiently. Great, thanks. Tim? Yes, I'd, I'd be slightly optimistic. I, I think 5G is a step in the right direction of having features which, if used um, fully, can help us reduce that energy. We, we're seeing the, the need for more power at the base station is because we have to keep these legacy networks alive as well. So when they are decommissioned, when 3G is turned off and 4G at some point, it will help enormously. So, so that is part of the solution. And then 5G and its evolution can get on and concentrate with how we can implement the features which turn down the energy consumption rather than constantly turning up the throughput and the, the bits. Um, so that's the trade-off which James refers to. And there's going to be a tussle there constantly between um, the seller and the buyer. And we need the buyer to be more assertive to say they want a green network, I would say. All right, thank you. And Monty, any final thoughts on that? No, I, I mean, I agree. I, I think what James Jones said, I think it's this balance between the, you, you know, the buyers and the sellers. You know, I think effectively, you know, we got to move to a greener environments in all, all these areas, but at the same time, the people consuming all of them, you know, I guess as James said, you can't have all the bells and whistles, that, you know, if, if you want to balance things correctly. So I think it's just finding that right, you know, equilibrium between, you know, what the consumers want and, and what we as a, enterprises need, need to provide, but in a, in a more greener way. So I think it's just finding that right balance, which I think will take time. I think it will evolve on positive. It will happen, but I just think it's a, it's an evolution. Great, thank you. Okay, well, I'm mindful of the, of the clock where we're almost out of time. So thank you very much to our panel today. It's been really interesting. Good, a good start to a new series of Hard Talk. Um, I, I see from the, the comments that some people weren't able to see James's slides at the beginning. So th those will be emailed out to everyone that registered for the session today. So you'll be able to catch up on those. Um, so great, thank you to the audience. Thank you to the panel. And uh, we'll hope to see you on the next one in early February. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. You.